Talking about north and south out of Daniel 11 this morning. Of course, immediately when you think about north and south, anybody who's ever gone to school and taken a history class, north and south, that's the Civil War, right? I don't know to this day why it's called a Civil War. I've never thought that war was in any way civil, but that's what it's called, or it's sometimes called the war between the states, or north versus south. I grew up in the north, presumably most of us here did. And uh, as such, when you go to school, if you grew up in the north, you get a certain perspective on that war. I moved to the south a few years ago to Georgia, and they have a different take on the war than what we have in the north. Uh, shortly after we moved to Georgia in the heart of the south, we went to Stone Mountain. I don't know if you've ever heard of Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain is the south's equivalent of Mount Rushmore, probably the best way I would describe it anyway, because on Stone Mountain, uh, instead of the presidents, you have the figures of Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. They're all carved on that. And anyway, if you stay on into the evening, you get to hear a narrative of the Civil War, and it just sounds different than what we had, uh, what we had heard growing up in the north. So north or south, depending on where you come from, you get a little different take on that so-called civil war. But we're not here to talk about that war. We're here to talk about a very epic struggle between north and south in the Middle East. And so I think there's a ring of relevance to what we look at today as we consider some history in terms of north and south in the Middle East and uh, some of these things that really extend down to what I've just read in the news this past week. So I think a very interesting study. So if you're into Daniel chapter 11, we're not going to read a lot of the verses today. There's a lot to read. So the best that we can do as we've been doing through much of Daniel is we're just going to be able to do this flyover where we take a look uh, at the verses and challenge you to study them on your own. Just basically introduce some of this information to you. And so uh, we're just a bit limited in what we can do on a Sunday morning, but I trust you've been doing that each week and that you will do that with chapter 11 as we walk away from it here today. Chapter 11 is closely tied to chapter 10 that we looked at last week. It's information that an angel sent by God to Daniel conveyed to him concerning his people, the Jewish people, and things that would be yet future uh, for Daniel and the people of God at that time. So verse 1 uh, we'll just take a quick look there. Again, I'm not going to read through these, but it makes mention of the first year of one Darius the Mede. And it's uh, talking about the angel speaking about the first year of his rule as a king that he was sent, apparently, to uh, be a protection and an encouragement to him, which I think is kind of interesting. Last week we looked at spiritual battle that goes on behind the scenes and some of the evil angelic beings over some of the governments of that time and a rather interesting perspective. Uh, here's a good angel who has come to provide encouragement and protection for this Darius the Mede the first year that he is a king. And I guess that probably says something about him as a, as a good ruler. Anyway, that first year of his reign, historians date as 539 to 538 BC if you want to get all the facts straight. Verse 2, again, just kind of flying over. Verse 2, the angel mentions there would be a series of four Persian kings that would follow after him. Maybe it helps if I say Iranian rulers. That makes it a little bit relevant. Well, it's out of that region. But four Persian rulers would arise after that. Verses 3 and 4 talk about someone who's very familiar to you if you've been in history class, Alexander the Great. We've talked about him before. And so again, keep in mind, all this is written many years in advance to these things taking place. But he talks about the rise of Alexander the Great. And in those verses, if you're looking at them, after his sudden death, his empire was divided between four of his generals. Two of those generals became very dominant, one in the northern region of Israel, modern-day Syria. The other south of Israel in modern-day Egypt. Does that sound just a little bit familiar to things that make the news? Syria, in a state of civil war. Egypt, some interesting things going on there. Well, anyway, what's old is new. We've talked about that a lot. And so we have these two dominant forces, one in the north of Israel, one in the south. And so verses 5 to 20, we're really flying over the verses. Verses 5 to 20, a series of military campaigns between those two dominant forces. 
Some would say historically there were six major battles. I brought a chart for you to look at for just a little bit if you want to get that. You may want to come back and get a copy of that later if you're really, really interested in digging in. Verse 6, flying over these verses, mentions a daughter of the king of the south. An interesting phrase. That would be Cleopatra. Not to be confused with the famous Cleopatra of Hollywood movie, but Cleopatra the first and an arranged marriage. You get to verses 21 to 35. They describe someone who is called a despicable person. We've talked about that individual before. Uh, this individual ruled from Antioch, the city of Antioch in Syria, about 175 to 163 B.C., 100, 200 years before the time of Christ. A man by the name of Antiochus IV, also known as Antiochus Epiphanes. As we mentioned in an earlier study, you could read 1st and 2nd Maccabees. You look in your Bible, you won't find those. Get a Catholic Bible and you'll find those two books there. And there's some history concerning him that you'll read in those books if you're interested in digging down. As we said in an earlier study, to, uh, not to make too much light of, but he was not a good guy, uh, to put it uh, mildly. He massacred 80,000 Jewish men, women, and children in his day. He desecrated the temple that was in the city of Jerusalem by sacrificing swine on the altar. He set up a statue of the god Zeus, which was not real uh, well received by the Jews, and he stopped their temporal sacrifices and even prevented Sabbath worship. Again, really not a very good guy. And we mention him because he's a type of Antichrist, one mentioned quite a bit in Scripture. Jesus referred in Matthew 24, 15, if you want to go to that verse at some point in time, he referred to someone future yet to his time on earth like that man. And so he represents a very evil tyrant who would arise on the scene. Verses 21 to the end of the chapter. I told you we were only going to fly over. Verses 21 to the end of the chapter, things get a little bit muddy in terms of understanding these things. Are they describing this man Antiochus that I just mentioned? Or are they describing someone yet future? You figure it out. I'm unclear on it. And uh, many Bible students are. So it's not entirely clear uh, who and what that is about. And so as we get closer to the time of the end, maybe it'll make some more sense. That's a very, very quick look at this particular chapter. One thing that stands out that I think is quite relevant to us today, if the past, as recorded in this chapter, is any pattern at all for the present and the future, and I happen to think that it is, then it is reasonable for us to look in the Middle East for there to be dominant northern and southern forces around Israel that are going to come to power near the time of the return of Christ. Let me share with you what some Bible students say on the subject. In Daniel chapter 11, says one writer, we are informed that the various conflicts that took place historically between these two kings would be repeated in the last days immediately before the coming of the Messiah, because verse 40 says, at the end time. I believe that to be a time future to us. The writer says the result of this last day's conflict between the northern king and his counterpart in the south will include massive regional wars, the defeat of Egypt, Libya, and northern Sudan, and ultimately the invasion and occupation of the nation of Israel. While numerous scholars and expositors throughout history have wrestled over the precise meaning of this passage, some are asking, if it is possible that we are now witnessing the emergence of the last day kingdoms of the north and south, which is where things get rather interesting. One writer talks about Turkey, which is part of that region of the northern king back in those days, stating that in the past 10 years, Turkey's prime minister, and I'm not sure I pronounce his name correctly, you may have to, to uh, correct me on that, uh, Erdogan, I guess his last name, has systematically dismantled the most well-established secular form of government in the Middle East while establishing and guaranteeing his own power for many more years to come, all in the name of, quote, democracy. It is said that the next significant step in Erdogan's plan to ensconce himself as Turkey's absolute ruler will come in the year 2014 
when his present term as prime minister will come to an end. Already in the works are Erdogan's plan to radically alter Turkey's present parliamentary system to a presidential system while placing him on the ticket to be the next president. Beyond this, the present five-year term for president will expand to a seven-year term. That's kind of an interesting thing. If successful, this will guarantee that Erdogan will be able to maintain power until at least 2021. But Erdogan's ambitions have caused many to believe that he is seeking a leadership role beyond Turkey throughout the whole region. Interesting in light of what we know concerning Bible prophecy. Another writer talking about Egypt. That makes the news a great deal. As Americans everywhere stop to celebrate Thanksgiving Day, Egyptian President Morsi appeared on Egyptian television and shocked the nation, issuing a presidential decree effectively banning all challenges to his decrees, laws, and decisions. An opponent of Morrissey accused the president of establishing himself as, quote, a new pharaoh. A writer goes on to say, could Erdogan in Turkey and Morsi in Egypt be the last day's kings of the north and south? Or are they merely precursors to the actual fulfillment of Daniel 11? Of course, we should be extremely cautious in considering these questions, but students of the scriptures would certainly do well to remain watchful and in a sober spirit of prayer concerning the momentous events we are now seeing unfolding throughout the Middle East. To add to that, I may be the only one interested in this stuff, but I'm very interested in it. Time Magazine last week, just last week, said that the U.S. administration made it clear to Israel in the course of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's visit that it has an array of its own interest in the Middle East. This phrase is especially interesting. It is banking on the Islamic regimes in Egypt and Turkey. The king of the north and the king of the south. The United States has a real interest in a dominant northern force and a dominant southern force in the Middle East. That certainly is of interest to us as we look at this chapter from so many years ago. Some events that may well be unfolding in this present age. Again, some of that stuff I've just shared is speculation. I don't like to speculate. That's a dangerous thing to do. Again, there's confusion. How much of Daniel 11 is fulfilled? How much is future yet to our lifetime? It's a challenge to figure it out. Whether it's past, whether it's future. There is one section that I've skipped over I want to go back and look at because there is a mention of the people of God in some challenging times. Whether in the days of this Antiochus Epiphanes or whether in the days of a future Antichrist, Whatever the case, the people of God are mentioned in verses 33 to 35. That could be you and I. And I want us to look at those three verses. What goes on with the people of God in those challenging days? Verse 33 says, Those who have insight, an interesting phrase, those who have insight among the people will give understanding to the many. Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity, and by plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they will be granted a little help, and many will join with them in hypocrisy. Some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge, and make them pure until the end time, because it is still to come at the appointed time. The phrase to notice is those who have insight. A group of people called those who have insight. The last chapter of Daniel, chapter 12, talks about those individuals that have insight as the resurrected ones. I take that to mean the people of God. That can be us as well as the faithful out of Israel. But those who have insight, these are some descriptives of them during the difficult times. It says they will give insight or understanding to many. I think that fits the disciples of God and of Christ in any age to give understanding to the many. What are the people of God about, especially at difficult times? To enlighten, to evangelize, to make disciples in any age, to give understanding to the many. So there's a timeless quality to this, whether in the past, whether in our age, whether in the future. As those who have insight, we give understanding to the many. We're about the message. We're about sharing the good news, and I think in the darkest days, people have the greatest interest. 
And so if there are dark days to come, we have our greatest opportunity in those days to give understanding to the many. Unfortunately, this is less pleasant news. Persecution is the lot of the people of God in those days. They will fall by the sword or by flame, it says. We're reminded in Acts 14.22, the Apostle Paul says, Through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And so God's people in any age go through difficulties. It's never a cakewalk time to be a follower. And so through many tribulations we enter the kingdom of God. And it may be a, a lot of tribulation in those days if we should be around. It says that when they fall, they will be granted a little help. The people of God that will fall will be granted the help by God's Spirit, I believe, is what is mentioned there in verse 34. And so in the most difficult times, God's Spirit is there to enable the most. It says that many will join with them in hypocrisy. And that's not terribly pleasant either, that sadly in the last days there are those who join the people of God that hold a form of godliness, but deny its power, as 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 says would happen. And so that's the case. Not everyone who gathers with the people of God have sincere and pure motives. But the best news of all is it says that God will refine and purge and make them pure until the end time. So whether believers in the past, whether us now, whether us into the future and followers in the future, whatever the case, this is God's plan for His people. He is in the refining process. He is purging that which is ungodly out of us. He's making us pure until the time of the end. What God has planned is on track. It doesn't depend on the rise and falls of governments, all the things we've been looking at in Daniel. God's plan continues on for His people. And so God continues to refine us in any age. God purges us. God makes us pure. And I'm reminded of Philippians 1, 6 along with that. Being confident of this, the Apostle Paul says, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That verse takes on special significance as you think of the time of the end. If we're in the last generation, if we're in the last days, and it's hard to know that, but we'd like to think that, if that be the case, we stand with confidence, even as Paul did around 2,000 years ago, that the one who has begun the good work is going to be faithful to bring it to completion on that day when Christ appears. That's been the hope of believers in every age. That is our hope. And so while we might be unsettled by things like we've been reading in Daniel, we hold on to this that God is in the process with His people. He has started something, and He's not going to give up part way through and say it's too difficult. You're too much of a challenge. I don't want to finish what I started. No. He has begun a good work, and He carries it on to completion on that day when we see Christ face to face. And of course, that's the one thing that stands out above all the difficulties of this present age. We see Him face to face, don't we? We stand in His presence, and we are made like Him as we see Him on that day. And that's what I stake it all on, is that the process is at work in my life as it is in yours. Challenging times are coming, I'm certain of that. But the plan is underway. The good work continues on. And we remain faithful. We draw closer to one another, the more difficult the times. But we continue on. We persevere. We are overcomers. And that's the most important thing we should consider in all these things. I leave you with that confident statement of the Apostle Paul amidst these things that have been a bit challenging in our studies from Daniel in particular. Amen.